Welcome to the St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship Podcast. Today, one of our teaching leaders, Brett Tatko, will be discussing Genesis chapter 27. St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship, or BSF, is currently meeting virtually on Zoom every Monday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time. For more information and to connect with our class, visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. That's bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Let's prepare our hearts, open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 27, and join Brett as he shares truths from God's Word. Hey, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to BSF. We're going to be looking at Genesis 27 tonight, Isaac blessing Jacob. Let me pray for us, and we'll jump right into our passage. Heavenly Father, thank you for the way that you work, despite the fact that much of the motivation of our heart is sinful. Lord, thank you that your plan for Jacob being your chosen offspring was not foiled by Isaac and Rebekah's interference. Lord, as we look to this passage tonight, I pray that you would reveal to us how sin might be blinding our own hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Vic and I have lived in this house for about 20 years. This is our basement, so we do our recording here in the basement. And when we first moved in, the house did not come with a refrigerator, and it's sort of an appliance that you need. So we arranged to get a used one, and we've now had this used refrigerator for 20 years. And normally, when you go inside the fridge, you know you open it up, and we have a kind of a side by side refrigerator. You open up the refrigerator side, and it's close to forty degrees, typically give or take, depending upon what you have in there. Um, but about five years ago, we opened up the fridge, and it was a rather balmy sixty five. Now, this tends to happen with appliances. They get old, they stop working right. But the timing of this failure was super awkward. It happened on a Friday night about 11 p.m. I had just driven home from Chicago, so I was pretty tired. Vic had just finished hosting about 20 people at our house for a party. And when you have a party, I mean, people come, they eat, they enjoy the food, but you have leftovers and you've kind of bought a bunch of food to feed these people. And so... It was a bad time for the fridge to stop working, but there we were. The fridge forced us into action at 11 p.m. at night. We moved food into boxes. We took it over to other people's houses. Some of it went to our son's house. Some of it went to our our in-law's home. We put some things into the freezer. It was a late night, uh, but we did survive it, and we managed to save most of our food, and we fixed the refrigerator. Now, that took a couple of days, and we had to order some parts on the internet, but you know, we thought it was behind us. We had replaced the part that failed, and we were looking forward to another 20 years of service from this fridge now that the part had been repaired. But since that time, about five years ago, when it first occurred, we've had the same thing happen two other times, where the fridge gets warm. And then we know that this part has failed once again. And so even though our fridge, we have the same fridge today, it's working. But we always wonder, when is the the failure of this defrost heater going to rear its head and force an agenda on us again? And, you know, I think as we've been going through the book of Genesis, one of the things that maybe you've been wondering is when are we going to see sin make itself known in the passage again. We've, we've seen it happen throughout where sin is a major problem that, that God has been... We've, we, it looks like God is responding to that sin, but in reality, God, is, uh, God has plan A. But sin has shown up many times in the passage. We've seen it in the, the fall of Adam and Eve. We've seen it in the life of Cain. We've seen it in the generation of Noah. We've seen sin come in, the Tower of Babel, another time. Sin has come in and there have been radical implications, radical things that have been required in order for uh, sin to be addressed and dealt with. Uh, So as we come to our passage tonight, what we're going to see, this is really the first time I think we've seen this, is that God's plan is really not disrupted by human rebellion, which we're going to call sin. We're going to see instead that some of this rebellion in the hearts of Isaac and Rebekah and Esau and Jacob end up accomplishing exactly what God had intended from the beginning, to have Isaac bless Jacob. 
But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's just remember where we are in the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis 27. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to be in those passages tonight. And last week, remember, we're starting to look at the generations of Isaac. Abraham has died. He's been buried. And so we're looking at this generation, this this, this lifespan of, of the person of Isaac. Vicki introduced us to him last week, and she really pointed out to us that we've seen in the passage two major things that have been resolved. First of all, we've seen the pattern of land, or that three-part promise to Abraham was land, seed, and blessing. And we've seen the promise of land be fulfilled in Isaac's life. Genesis 26, 22, uh, this is a quote from Isaac, For now the Lord, and it's the covenantal name of God, Yahweh, has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And so that's Isaac speaking, and even he was realizing that God has been caring for not only Isaac, but also his broader family. Also, uh, we've seen God provide offspring, seed, have been provided to Isaac. Genesis twenty five twenty one. Isaac prayed to the Lord, again, that covenantal name, Lord, uh, Yahweh. He prayed for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. And not only did Isaac have a single child, he had twins, Jacob and Esau. And so once again, we're at a crossroads in the same situation that we were with Isaac and Ishmael. We were wondering which one of those two offspring was going to be the one that God was going to deliver his promise on. Now, God was very clear it was going to be through Isaac. But now we have two other boys, two sets of twin boys, the elder Esau and the younger Jacob. And as we look at uh, this situation, we know that Isaac is going to have to bless one of them. He is getting old. He's going to have to carry that, that promise, that covenantal relationship with the Lord is going to have to carry on. So let's look and see what happens. Uh, we're look, looking at uh, this first division, Genesis 27, 1 through 17. We're going to look at the planned blessing and then also the deception that occurs with this blessing. There's a couple of key verses from Genesis 25 that we want to keep in mind as we're looking at Genesis 27. The first one is when Rebecca inquired of the Lord, what is happening to me? What is going on within my womb? Uh, and this is what the Lord responded to her. Genesis 25 verse 23 Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. One thing to remember. First thing to remember. Second thing, Genesis twenty five, twenty eight. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So we have a problem with favoritism, and we also have the pronouncement of the Lord essentially saying that the older shall serve the younger. Jacob's younger, Esau's older. Let's see how it's going to play out. Isaac in verses 1 through 4 thinks he's near death. He's going to live for about 40 more years, but doesn't matter. He thinks he's near death. His plan is to deliver a blessing to Esau. And so he calls him in and he says, Esau, my son, I'm old. I don't know when I'm going to die. Go out and get me some tasty meat, some tasty game. Maybe it was going to be goat, maybe some kind of wild sheep. We don't exactly know. But he asked Esau to go out, get food, make a meal. And then the plan was is that Isaac was going to bless Esau. Now, when we look ahead at the blessing that he was going to pronounce in verse in, in uh, verses 26 through 29, this really just wasn't a process of sorting out his material wealth. Typically, in Old Testament times, the eldest child got a double portion of the wealth of the family. That's not what Isaac is necessarily thinking about here. He might be thinking about that, but he's also thinking about who is going to carry on the covenantal relationship, who is going to bring uh, the seed of the woman who will ultimately overcome the serpent, who is going to be the one that God, that the special someone, the special person that God is going to work through. And, And Isaac is saying, I'm going to deliver that prophetic blessing to Esau. Now, Rebecca hears this conversation. They lived in tents. The tent walls were obviously not very thick. So in verses 5 through 17, chapter 27, Rebecca hears it and she instantly starts planning. We've already seen her be quick on her feet, watering camels, running around uh, in her hometown uh, when she when the servant was there to bring her back to Isaac. So if we know she's quick, we know she's uh, insightful, and so all of a sudden she very quickly comes up with a plan to present Jacob in front of Isaac disguised as Esau. He grabs some goats from their herd. 
She dresses him in Esau's clothing. She cooks him meals. She gives him bread. And she now has him disguised as the hairy man Esau, getting ready to go in and receive the blessing. If we look in verses 18 through 29, also in chapter 27, we're going to see Jacob go in the room. Now, we might be thinking that Jacob is just sort of going along with what mom asked, but the reality is almost the first words out of his mouth are just a bold-faced lie. I am Esau, your firstborn. So yes, it was Rebecca's idea, but Jacob is very much complicit in this deception. There was a bunch of things that were wrong with this conversation, and Isaac picks up on some of them. He's worried about the voice. Uh, He's worried about how quickly the, the food was able to be obtained and prepared. But regardless of those concerns, even if we think about the meat itself, right? So the, so Esau is going to go out and he's going to hunt wild animals. These are animals that would just be living rough, living off the land. Jacob went out and grabbed a couple of goats that were, that were like in the herd. Uh, the quality of the meat, it was going to taste different. So everything should have been off here. You know, I mean, the alarm bells should have been going off on Isaac's head. We know that he had problems seeing. But it seems that you know he was so set on what he wanted to do, he wasn't willing to evaluate what might be going on here. He's tricked by the costume. He's tricked by the, the goat skin hair that is, that is adorning Jacob. And he goes ahead and he gives the covenantal blessing, not to Esau, but to Jacob. This is really fulfilling exactly what God said was going to happen. His chosen person to carry on that covenantal relationship was Jacob. And there was a lot of deception. There were a lot of things that happened to make this occur. But uh, ultimately, that blessing is given to Jacob, not to Esau. Jacob leaves the tent very quickly. Esau comes in and he's back. He's ready to receive the blessing. He's ready to be, you know, experience. He's, he, he did what his dad asked him to do. And uh, this makes, first of all, Isaac is very upset. There's violent shaking. Uh, and, and, and Isaac really stands by what he had already done. I, I think that in this moment, Isaac realized you're not going to get around God's will. Uh, God's will had always been that Jacob would be the one who was going to receive the blessing. And Isaac stands by the blessing of Jacob. He does give a blessing to Esau. It's definitely a lesser blessing. And we can see, you know, Ray, rightly so. We understand how Esau is feeling. He's angry. He feels like he's been deceived twice. By Jacob, the name Jacob sort of rhymes with sounds like deceiver or he cheats, and so this is something where Esau is now quite unhappy. As we read through the narrative here, as we look through this first bunch of verses, the narrator, the text, doesn't really provide us with a lot of indicators with regard to the internal motivation of any of the participants. Perhaps all of them knew the blessing or the or the the prophecy that the Lord spoke to Rebecca before the twins were born perhaps they all knew that the younger was going to to you know be in charge of the older maybe they all knew this we we don't know we're not really given a lot of indicators in terms of like what was the motivation you know should we should we feel like Rebecca was doing the right thing and and you know that Esau and Isaac were wrong we really don't have that but the reality is, is that we're seeing a family where there's a lot of self-interest, there had been favoritism, there's certainly a lack of communication, a lack of trust, and an over and, and, and a self-indulgence seemed to rule this family. This is certainly not a family that we would look at as a model family, working well together, following God as a family unit, trusting Him. Uh, there's definitely some places where we can look at the motivation of these individuals and say, it's at best mixed. At best, the motivation is mixed. Isaac is trying to put forward his favorite. Rebecca is trying to put forward her favorite. Just because Rebecca's favorite lines up with the blessing of God, does that make her right? It's hard to say. The reality is, is that God was able to work through these sinful, self-motivated people to ultimately bring about the outcome that he had always intended, that Jacob would receive the blessing. The thing we can think about is that kind of over all of this is this idea that Isaac was blind. The whole reason that this deception could work is that Isaac was not able to physically see the person that was in the room. But perhaps, as we think about the way that sin works, 
perhaps all of the characters in our narrative have had some amount of blinding because of sinful motivation uh, in their hearts and in their minds. And I think that that's the principle I want us to think about for this first section, is that sin tricks us. Sin tricks us into thinking that, that by sinning, we can accomplish something, that we can do something. And, and I'll, I'll give you a story about this. I, I went mountain biking one time in college at a place up in southern Wisconsin called Kettle Moraine. And I had been there once before, and I, I knew that there was maybe a fee. I, I knew there was a fee, and I saw a sign that said there's a fee. You had to pay. You had to pay five bucks in order to use the park. Now, I knew this. I had been there before. I saw the sign. I saw the place where the money went. I didn't have five bucks. I was in college, didn't have a lot of money. There were five of us there, and I didn't really say anything. Didn't really notify the other people that I was with, like, hey, there's a sign. Does anybody have any money? We need 25 bucks for us to go out and ride the trail. I figured that we'd have a great day of biking. We'd save the 25, maybe get something to eat on the way back to school. And what were the chances that we'd bump into a park ranger anyway? Well, it turns out the chances were pretty good. Uh, About two miles into our ride, we did bump into a park ranger. He was specifically there looking to see if we had the the tag that indicated that we had paid our five bucks, and he fined us. So we ended up having to pay each of us. There was a fine that he levied, not five dollars, but five times five dollars. And furthermore, we had to leave one of the people who was with us with the park ranger as a promise that we would come back and pay him now the $125 that we needed to to get our buddy out of jail. Uh, Our day was ruined. We spent most of the time trying to figure out, like, where can we get $125 to pay this guy? We lost the day. We lost the $125. And my sin, my my sinful attitude, I thought I was going to gain something. I thought I was going to get you know, a free day in the park and maybe a free dinner. And the reality was, is that I lost it all. Uh, I lost the day. I looked like a fool in front of my friends. Uh, I looked like a fool in front of the park ranger. And uh, it was just a complete waste because I had chosen to pursue a sinful path rather than pursuing a righteous path. And if we look at the things that happened in this family, Isaac and Rebecca were both trying to get something that they wanted. They felt that by sinning, by being deceptive, by going against what what God had intended, that they were going to get the result that they wanted. They were going to have Esau be blessed, or they were going to have Jacob be blessed. But the reality is, is that they missed out. They all missed out on the opportunity to come together as a family and seek the Lord. This was something that was a big deal in the family of Isaac and Rebekah. You would like to think that they were going to pursue God. Where are the where is the Isaac and Rebecca that showed so much faith and so much confidence in the Lord uh, as he brought them together as a married couple? Uh, instead, God is sovereign. It worked out exactly the way that God wanted, but the family, the four main actors in this, really missed out on the fullness of what God had from them by following a path of honesty and trust in the Lord. You know, I think it's a good question for you and for me to consider is what do we think that we're going to gain by sinning? Uh, you know, there's very appealing for us to think like, you know, maybe we'll, you know, I don't know, we'll get a discount or we'll get a deal or we'll, we'll get hired or we'll get promoted. You know, there's a lot of things that we think we're going to obtain by rebelling against God, by pursuing our own path. We feel like God has a standard for us. It's too high and it's too much and he wants us to be more all the time. And if I could just lie in this situation... The outcome would be better for me. You know, I think like as we look at this situation in the life of Isaac and Rebecca, it's easy for us to say like, y'all should have been talking more. Y'all should have been been talking about this situation as a family. This should have been a point of prayer. And certainly Isaac and Rebecca, as the husband and wife, you should have you should have had a conversation about who was going to receive the blessing. You know, it's easy for us to look in here and see it, and maybe. There's a place in your life or a place in my life where we just need some review. We need like an audit. We need to talk to someone that we trust, pastor, friend, counselor, and say like, hey, I'm thinking about this. How does it sound to you? And it might be as obvious to them as it is to us when we look at Genesis 27 that something's off. My final question for this division is if you think about what have you really truly received when you have resisted temptation? 
the times when you've stood up to it, when you've, when you've been tempted to sin, you've been tempted to do something that you know is outside of God's law, apart from what God would want you to do. What have been some things that you have received from the Lord, some blessings? Uh, what have been some ways that you've been impacted, that your life has been different because you've resisted temptation? If you could kind of make like a pro and con or like two lists of the things that you've tried to get when you've sinned, and the things that you've truly received when you've resisted temptation, I guarantee that the list of those things that you've received when you've resisted temptation will be far more appealing in the long run than some of those short-term things that you were motivated to, to get by sinning. Well, let's take a look at the outcome of this deception in the lives of this family. We're in verses 41 through 46, and right away we can see the first problem is that Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing that his father had blessed him with. Uh, And Esau was now looking for an opportunity to be able to kill Jacob. Esau continued to sin. He hated his brother. He, He wanted to kill him because essentially God had chosen Jacob to be the carrier of the covenantal blessing. Uh, Similar to maybe Isaac, Esau had his own idea about what the right way forward was, and the right way forward was for Esau to be on top. He hated his brother, he wanted to kill him, and uh, Rachel was so concerned she wanted to physically separate the two brothers so that uh, one would not kill the other, which would be be harmful for both, for uh, Esau to kill Jacob. Second, there was a separation that was going to happen now in the family, We can see the beginnings of a plan for Rebecca to send Jacob away, to send Jacob back to Laban and Bethuel, back in the land of Paddan Aram. And so Jacob's going to be leaving, and it's going to be happening pretty quickly. We'll see it more next week. But there there were some problems in this family before the deception, some lack of communication, some lack of trust. Uh, The deception did not make those problems any better, and we're not really seeing the opportunity for the family to be able to resolve their differences, to be able to stand before the Lord and seek forgiveness from him and seek forgiveness from each other. Uh, And so now there's separation of the family. There's the lack of opportunity uh, for them to resolve the damage that's happened because of the deception. There was damage certainly between Jacob and Esau. But furthermore, I would I'd say there's probably some problems between Isaac and Rebekah, and certainly some problems between Esau and Rebekah. Just trust is out. Uh, every, everybody's pursuit of their own ends that led to the deception uh, is going to have lingering impact for all of these people as they try to carry on with their lives in the land of Canaan. The other problem that's happening, and we're going to have to see how it gets resolved in the coming pages of the book of Genesis, is that Jacob is no longer in the land. You know, we've seen an emphasis that God has had both on Abraham and Isaac to stay in the land, to walk through it, to be a sojourner. And now with Jacob, he's received the blessing. We know that he's the one that God's going to work through, but he's leaving the land. And so we're, we're going to have to figure out, how's he going to get back? What's it going to look like? I mean, he got the blessing, but he has no offspring, and he's losing the land. And so this is something that we'll have to see uh, how God resolves this in the coming weeks uh, as Jacob prepares to depart. Well, I, I think we've talked a little bit about this. I think one of the principles that overrides this whole passage is that God is sovereign. He is going to use mixed motivation, even sinful desires that will ultimately be able to carry out his plan. Uh, God does not condone sin. God is opposed to sin. But but we are definitely seeing here that some of this mixed motivation of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Esau ultimately accomplished exactly what God intended. The reality, though, for our four main actors in this passage is that sin has very real consequences. Uh, they, we're gonna, we aren't going to necessarily see them work out all their interpersonal differences. We will 20 years later with Jacob and Esau. But it's not dissimilar from a sporting event. Uh, there are penalties in sports. You violate the rules, and you're going to have to face some kind of penalty. Now, in football, or it tends to be yardage. In, in basketball, you get a certain number of fouls. But in lacrosse and hockey, when you, when you get a penalty, 
You have to leave the game. You have to go sit in the penalty box or stand in the penalty box. And the rest of your team has to deal with the opposing team that now has one more player on the field than your team does. And, and so not only is there consequences in, in sport, the sporting world for the, the, the one who obtains the penalty, but also for the rest of the team, that's also the reality with sin. Sin certainly has personal consequences for us, and we need to do business with the Lord to be able to seek forgiveness and repentance for the things that we do against Him. But there's also impacts with the way that we interact with other people. When, when this family sinned, they harmed each other. And not only did they have to do business with the Lord, they were going to have to deal with one another as well. So if you just think about your own experience, what are some of the personal consequences of sin that you've experienced in your life? What are some of the ways that that you've been uh, either rebuked or shamed or embarrassed or, or found guilty in a court of law for things that you've done wrong that are in violation of, of God's rule for you? But I think it's also important for us to think about what are some of the ways that our sin impacts other people, whether it's our family, our friends, our teachers, people around us. The things that you and I do wrong don't stay with us. They're going to go out and have an impact on those that we are around. And certainly one way that we can we aren't going to be able to undo the things that we've done in the past, but certainly by seeking forgiveness, by following up with other people and apologizing for the ways that we've hurt them or wronged them can go a long way towards restoring us uh, to the to the place where we are in those relationships and with those people. Um, I still have an old fridge. Uh, my old refrigerator that's now 20 plus years old is upstairs in my kitchen, happily running away. There's a good chance that some Friday night, that 65 degree temperature is going to rear its head again, and it's going to radically change my plans. In the same way, you and I still live, we still operate in a world where sin is present. It's still here. Uh, It was present in the lives of Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebekah, and sin is still present in the world that you and I live in today. However, the major difference that we have from Isaac and Rebekah is that Jesus has died on the cross, and one of his reasons for doing that was to be able to overcome sin and death. Now, we haven't experienced the fullness of that yet. We know that sin has been defeated. We know that Jesus is one, and the cross is where he won. But sin is present in this world, and we are still going to experience it. Now, someday, I might get a new fridge. I might go to the store, pick out a nice new one, and I won't have to deal with the old fridge, the problems of the old fridge. The problem will go away. And in the same way, one of these days, Jesus is going to return to this earth again, and he's promised that when he comes back, Sin will not just be overcome and set aside or put down. Sin will ultimately be defeated and cast out of this world. A day is coming when our, we will no longer have to face temptation. We will no longer hurt ourselves and each other when temptation and sin enter our lives. But the critical decision that we have to make today is what will we say to Christ? What will we say to Jesus? His death on the cross opened the door for humanity to be restored, for humanity to experience what it would be like again to live in a place where sin does not rule and sin is not even present. And so it's critical that you and I decide how will we respond to Jesus. Jesus will welcome all who come to him in this time before his second return. So we have a chance to respond to Christ today, to maybe experience that forgiveness for the first time, or potentially go back to the cross and experience forgiveness for the thousandth time. The decision is there. Make sure that you don't delay any longer because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have in this day and age to be forgiven uh, because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Lord, I pray that you would not let anyone delay. If there is an opportunity for someone to come to know you for the first time and what you've done for them at the cross, Lord, I pray that it would happen. And for those of us who have been believers for a long time, Lord, I pray that we would come back again and experience forgiveness for the ways that we have rebelled and pursued our own interests rather than trust in you. I pray all this in the powerful name of Christ. Amen. Thanks again for listening to the St. Louis Young Adults BSF Podcast. 
Join us next time on Zoom on Monday, February 8th at 7 p.m. Central Time as we discuss Genesis chapter 28. To connect with our class, like us on Facebook at STLYABSF or visit bsfinternational.org class 793. Bible Study Fellowship is an international, interdenominational, nonprofit organization that is dedicated to studying God's Word one verse at a time and strengthening the local church. For more information, visit bsfinternational.org. That's bsfinternational.org.